Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Friday, everybody. Today's video will be very financial system heavy. We remember earlier this week, Beijing held its twice in a decade Central Financial Work Conference. Assessing the current crisis in the financial sector and setting priorities for financial work in the next five years. This is a very important event, especially at this point in history, with the state of the Chinese financial and fiscal systems. However, the event readout was light on details, and China analysts and commentators, as well as markets, have been debating all week what exactly Beijing will do next. In today's video, we in part examine several different voices domestically and internationally within this debate, and we ourselves try to get an understanding of how Beijing plans on tackling these crises in its financial sector. We have already unpacked some of this debate in earlier videos. Today's discussion is designed to supplement that. Let's begin with a special long editorial commentary published by respected Chinese financial media outlet Sai Xin, which seeks to answer this question through a Q and A format. Let's examine some of this here, and we are now quoting selected extracts directly. Why is this year's Central Financial Work Conference so important? The meeting, chaired by Xi Jinping, came at a critical time amid slowing economic growth, a protracted property industry slump, beaten down stock markets, and mounting local government debt. This year's work conference stressed that finance is the lifeblood of the national economy and key to the country's core competitiveness. What are some of the key problems the meeting addressed? The meeting warned of prominent. Intertwined problems in the financial sector, hidden economic and financial risks, the sector's ineffectiveness in serving the real economy, and chronic corruption. Why does the property market matter so much to the financial system? China's property market plunged into a liquidity crisis in 2021 after the central government launched a deleveraging campaign targeting over-indebted developers. The policy contributed to a slump in home sales, and prices fell as confidence sagged. Now the crisis has hit some of the nation's largest developers, such as Country Garden Holdings Co., despite a string of measures to ease the crunch. Some developers have defaulted on billions of dollars of offshore bonds. Many developers have left behind unfinished projects with limited access to financing. The property slump has hit China's stock markets hard. The CSI 300 index plunged to a 4.5-year low on the 24th of October. The index has declined about 10% so far this year after a series of measures to prop up the stock market fell short. How does the meeting try to tackle the mounting local government debts? Policymakers have become increasingly concerned with the risks posed by local governments of balance sheet borrowings after years of costly COVID controls and a prolonged property crisis. Any large-scale defaults could destabilize the financial system. Local governments went four trillion yuan into the red during the three-year pandemic. China said at the meeting that it will set up a system to resolve local government debt risks and build mechanisms to manage government debt that supports high-quality economic growth. The next commentary, which we need to look at, is from Chen Long, lead economist and co-founder at Plenum, an independent research platform on China. Chen writes yesterday, quote. The financial market gets a mention in the readout, but the tone has clearly shifted since 2017. For the FX market, this year is more about control. The readout calls for strengthening management of the foreign exchange market and keeping the RMB exchange rate stable at a reasonable equilibrium. This phrasing may sound boilerplate today, but it stands in sharp contrast with the readout from 2017, which included language like improving forex market mechanisms and deepening RMB exchange rate mechanism reform. The updated language means the top leaders have endorsed. Or even mandated the People's Bank of China's recent interventionist approach to keep the RMB at around 7.3 against the U.S. dollar. Perhaps the most important change this year, compared with six years ago, is that the party's leadership over the sector is highlighted throughout the readout. This reflects China's new governance leadership, in which the party exercises unified supervision over all aspects of government. End quote. 
In a special commentary published today, Zhong Zhengsheng, the chief economist at Ping An Securities, expressed, "In my opinion." A long-term mechanism on handling local government debt risks covers not only localities' implicit debt but also their explicit debt. With the growing scale of special-purpose bonds, some local governments are approaching the red line where annual special-purpose bonds interest payments exceed 10% of their government-managed fund expenditure. This creates pressure for fiscal restructuring. The long-term mechanism should be able to restrain the growth of implicit debt while encouraging local governments to use other fiscal resources to stabilize economic growth. And on this theme, Zhe Chanwang and Jia Yuxuan at Peking Knowledge write that the phrase in the conference readout quote optimize the debt structure of central and local governments. End quote, signals that central government will take on more debt and local governments will take on less. Regular viewers will remember that there has been an ongoing debate among policymakers surrounding whether the central government, with its last clean balance sheet, will take on some of the bad debt from local governments, thus giving particularly strained localities a bit more fiscal wiggle room, or whether local governments themselves will have to deal with their own massive debt piles. Likely, ultimately, through the sale of assets. This is a topic which Professor Michael Pettis, who we often quote, has discussed for some time too. Quote, it seems to me that China is better off in the medium to long term if it can force an earlier rather than later resolution of the local government debt problem, and this requires writing it down. Shifting the borrowing to the central government isn't a solution unless it is done only partially and only to give a little time for local governments to write down the debt backed by non-productive assets against the productive assets they own and control. This won't be practically or politically easy, but simply rolling over the debt by expanding Beijing's exposure isn't a solution. It is just a way to postpone a solution. End quote. The debate surrounding how Beijing will try to reform its 60 trillion U.S. dollar plus financial sector and prevent the deepening of this crisis continues. Next up, the funeral of Li Keqiang. Hey everyone, if you're getting some value from today's episode, don't forget to hit that like button. Liking, sharing, and subscribing are all big helps for the channel. And for anyone who can go the extra mile and help me keep the channel financially sustainable, allow me to continue making these episodes. Every day, open and free for all. Patreon and buy me a coffee links are in the description below. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Yesterday, Thursday, Beijing held the funeral service for former Premier Li Keqiang, who we remember stepped down earlier this year and recently suddenly died officially of a heart attack. Xi Jinping and the rest of the standing committee, as well as other leadership and officials, attended. Around 9 a.m., Xi and his wife Pang Liyuan and others walked slowly up to Li Keqiang's remains, and, in the words of state media, stood in solemn silence to pay their tributes, making three bows. They shook hands with Li's family members, offering their condolences. Hu Jintao sent a wreath to express his condolences over Li's passing. Li's remains were cremated. The mourning protocol was very similar to that of former Premier Li Peng, who died at the age of 90 in 2019. The same day, Thursday, yesterday, the party published a detailed account of his life, which praised Li for reforming China's scientific and technological system, promoting innovation and some reform. But also added that Li quote resolutely safeguarded the authority and centralized, unified leadership led by Xi Jinping at its core. End quote. On this point, the U.S. and Taipei-based China Media Project published a piece the same day called "Sidelined in Death as in Politics," which expressed, quote, "Since former Chinese Premier Li Keqiang passed away last week, his legacy has been quietly boxed up and filed away. The current leadership under Xi Jinping hopes that the nation can move quickly past his pragmatism." And the questions it raised about the present. End quote. This week, leaked directives suggest that state censors in Beijing were concerned about quote overly effusive comments end quote which quote offer exaggerated praise on the surface end quote as they could be implicit criticism of the current leadership under Xi. We end with these observations made by UK-based The Economist. 
quote, At a press conference in 2020, Li shocked some urbanites by reminding them that around 600 million Chinese subsist on just 1,000 yuan, 137 US dollars, a month. He also admitted that COVID had hit poor families hard. At other times, he called for checks on arbitrary government power and for the public to supervise officials' work. Many Chinese recall those Li sayings now. They are making a political point whether they admit it or not. As a reform-era technocrat, Li served a one-party system that sought legitimacy through governing performance. Many Chinese miss that time. That is surely what they mean when they call Li practical and in touch with the masses. Today, China has one-man rule and the party rejects external supervision. To admit problems in this China is to doubt Mr. Xi, an impossibility. China will be mourning that loss of accountability for a long time to come. End quote. That is today's episode of China Update. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful Friday, and I will see you all tomorrow.